Mori is a game that's hard to describe to someone without them having experienced it for themselves. Upon just opening the game, something felt off. It was unsettling, uncomfortable. I didn't watch any trailers or research ahead of time and bought it on the spot, so I went in completely blind. And that was one of the best impulsive decisions I've ever made. Omori stuck out as soon as I started playing. It felt familiar, but unpleasant. It felt different. So I decided to look into why. Why I felt the way I did. And this video is my answer. Close your eyes, you'll be here soon. What I personally tend to look for in a game is a compelling story. One with twists and turns that keeps the player guessing. One that creates a sense of suspense and tension for what's to come, while also having a cast of characters who can make me feel a sense of attachment, emotional connection. Omori is a game that's primarily about emotion, which is quite fitting as the entire game is built around this premise, manipulating the emotions of yourself and others. In a gameplay sense, this adds a sort of rock-paper-scissors element to the game. An enemy who becomes saddened takes more damage from opponents who are angry, happy takes more damage from saddened, and angry takes more damage from happy. However, that's not all. Each emotion also has their own buffs and debuffs, like how angry increases your attack damage but lowers your defense, or how happy increases your critical hit rate and speed but decreases accuracy. A relatively simple rock paper scissors system with some extra benefits and hindrances depending on the desired emotion. And then there's Afraid. When somebody becomes afraid, they cannot perform any actions. They are immobile, frozen, a statue. You are overcome with a sense of fear from not just what you're looking at, but a repressed memory clawing up from the depths of your soul. A single mistake that changed everything. This moment genuinely terrified me. I thought the beginning was a bit weird with white space and all, but I gradually forgot about it as the prologue progressed with the hide and seek game, learning the new mechanics, and meeting a huge number of characters at once, only to have it turned on its head in a horror-like scene that made my jaw drop. This moment right here, when Basil's eyes turned blood red and mentioned Marie, I was hooked. The intro was a little slow with a lot of character interaction, but it was all to build up to this moment, when you realize something is horribly wrong with this place. But the game leaves it completely as you appear back in white space. Kel, Hero, not Aubrey Marie, or Basil are anywhere to be seen. You're just left with the deafening sound of your own heartbeat, all alone, in your safe space. It was here, after spending a few minutes trying to wrap my head around what just happened, that I rechecked everything in white space. I had scrolled through the pages of the sketchbook to find there was a new image at the back of a black figure. I thought it kind of looked like a ghost, hair over one eye with the other exposed. Arms and the swirl thing ghosts tend to have. But what I found out at the end, this thing and the event that set off the entire adventure through headspace, were the same. It only hit me just then, after 30 plus hours of game time, that this was a game about a tragedy. A single mistake and a stretch of naive decisions that changed not only the life of Sunny, but of every person he was ever close to. A secret that was hidden from each and every character, including the player, except for the two that had to suffer with the weight of it all. Let's jump back to Whitespace for a second. After closing the sketchbook, I was honestly confused at what the game wanted me to do. I ran around for a bit trying to see if there was anything else besides the steak knife in the void, but came up empty. I felt like I had tried everything, and as a last resort I opened up the menu to see in blood red text... Stab. Even more than the event directly before this one, my first reaction was denial. I genuinely tried to convince myself there had to be something else. There's no way this was the right thing to do. 
It was like having a nightmare you've seen before and already knowing how it'll end. And like everything, after enough desperation, I ended up giving in. One aspect of the game I loved was the contrast between the two main areas you get to explore, Headspace and Sunny's hometown of Faraway. Being able to notice the different characteristics of the people you met only to realize who they were in Sunny's dream was a great realization. It added a sense of familiarity to Headspace, especially in the last resort segment of the game, where you get to see and interact with all the dream counterparts with full knowledge of who they are. This same reason is primarily why my favorite character is Aubrey. You get introduced to her in Headspace alongside Kel and Hero, and when you meet her, she's bubbly, caring, and empathetic to everybody. Except Kel. And you get to adventure with her to Basil's house, through vast forests, and in calming down SpaceX's boyfriend in Otherworld. Only to have expectations shattered when you finally meet, or well, I should say, confront her in the church. She's the only one out of the entire cast, including side characters, whose Headspace representation is the complete opposite of her in Faraway. The moment hit me hard in the church where it is put on display how different she is. It wasn't obvious how much Marie's death affected everyone until this moment. It shows how much a person can change when they don't have support in a time of need, especially by people she considered to be her best friends. The fear of losing yourself, the anxiety of isolation, frustration of being misunderstood, and the vacuum of loneliness. It meant everything to her. The all climaxes in a brawl with Aubrey. Even in her sprite, you can see how much pain she's in. To have your old friend show up in the middle of trying to mourn, accusing you of being a thief and embarrassing you to the point that they have to stop the sermon, is way beyond insensitive. In my playthrough, I lost to her just barely, but in the events that followed, it didn't feel like anybody won anything. It was a pointless fight that didn't and was never going to have a true winner. It was a fight on raw emotional impulse. This is what she has become. This is the same Aubrey from your dreams. Just one who was traumatized, betrayed, and ridiculed for trying to cope with someone she cared about. I realize that I'm only seeing this from Aubrey's side, but she's not the only one who suffered. Everyone did. You don't get to hear much from him, but Hero was equally as bad, if not worse, than Aubrey. But thanks to Kel and his parents, he was at least able to stand back up and move forward with his life. Something Aubrey wasn't given the chance to do. On good days, your neighbors invite you over for a visit. How can they have fun with someone as horrible as me? You miss them now. When will they come again? Maybe today will be a good day. Or maybe today is a day for sleeping. Somewhere in the back of your head, you have a feeling that you weren't always like this. You weren't always living in white space. The truth is, your story is already over. You just have to remember it. This is what makes the game stand out to me. The fact that the main events and plot points that would be in a typical story already happened and the game takes place in the consequences of those events. I feel like the structure of the game could have fallen through and easily ruined the narrative, but it managed to hold. Even better was finding out the twist that ended up being extremely shocking to me. I didn't see it coming. At all. Even in the moments leading up to where they show you, I was trying to piece together what the game was getting at and still had my head in my hands when the truth came out. All the imagery, subtext, and weird phenomena suddenly clicked in my head. Marie didn't commit suicide. It was a framed homicide. This was the story that we had to recover. The truth that we as the player wanted to know. All the little actions that seemed weird at the time made sense. For example, I got a bit flustered here when Kel and Hero walked up to comfort Aubrey as she broke down, but suddenly oddly backed away. In the moment, I said out loud, what the hell are you doing? But I realized afterwards that Sunny backed up 
because he was the one who scribbled out all the photos in the first place, learning that his best friend was bullied all this time for something he didn't even do. Sonny froze. At least that's my interpretation. Another aspect that makes the story work as well as it does are, well, the characters. Aubrey may be my favorite, but I personally love them all. And not just the main ones either. It feels like everyone in Headspace and in Faraway are unique. Gives both worlds a sense of realism, not in the sense that it's possible for them to exist in our world, but in the given context of their in-game universe. To be fair, most aren't that complex, but I don't think characters always need to be the most over-the-top or deepest thing ever. However, what can make a fleshed out world and even a good character is that they are believable in their given context. This can add a layer of depth and immersion that can do wonders for world building, which helps it stick out in your mind once the experience is finished. Now I want to switch gears for a second. This may feel uncomfortable for most people, so you can skip to the timestamp on screen if you feel you need to. I absolutely hate the idea that society has where men aren't allowed to cry. Otherwise, you're seen as weak. When I was seven years old, certain circumstances came up where I had to move away from everything I knew. Family, friends, familiar places I'd become accustomed to, everything. I didn't think much of it at the time, but the eventual toll this had on my mental state almost cost me my life. I was insecure, I was unconfident, I was stretched thin emotionally. It stayed bottled up, and every time emotions tried to come up to the surface, I'd shove them back down because I'm not weak. Only weak people cry. That mistake hurt me more than anything else. Eventually, one little thing happened that shouldn't have set me off, and I broke down completely. All of my negative emotions came out at once, and that was the first time I questioned what the point was in living. This is why, near the end of the game, when Sunny, Kel, Aubrey, and Hero are sleeping over at Basil's house and you have the final confrontation, I could see the same thing stirring in him that I felt myself, and I was genuinely fearful. This feeling climaxed when the game eliminated the option to be passive and forced you to attack him. I thought I was going to kill him. Seemingly infinite. A rainy highway with nothing but water below for kilometers ahead. Glimpses to a past that doesn't feel like it could have ever existed. A stage for a performance of a lifetime. This is my favorite moment. The moment that cemented this game among my favorites. After what I said before, the road to recovery wasn't exactly clear-cut. It took a lot of introspection and conversations to realize what events had happened that led me down that path. But I picked myself back up, strengthened my belief that life is in fact worth living, and learned to give myself the confidence to pursue what makes me happy, what makes life worth living for me. At last, Sonny is faced with the embodiment of all his doubt, his guilt, and his despair. Omori, your other half. The part of yourself you intended to defeat to get your life back. As white space disappears, Omori slashes his knife and you take him on for the first and final time. This fight was great. After the emotional roller coaster, you get to face off with the character you were playing as for the majority of the game. 
Omori is unrelenting and savage, exactly how he was the entirety of the journey through Headspace. But as much as you have the resolve to conquer your inner demon, you can't win. You can't push it down. You can't kill it. But you can accept it. Accept and understand it. Come to terms with yourself, what you did, and move on. Your past actions do not define you. With this finale, you wake up in the hospital to see flowers all around you, notes attached to each from all the people you helped and interacted with through your brief time in the sunlight of Faraway. It is blindingly bright, and in that light, you also see your friends heading north towards the exit. In that same light, you also see a glimpse of your lost friend heading in the opposite direction. I remember feeling confused, but assured. I immediately knew the decision I was going to make. I had come this far through the emotional roller coaster, and I was going to see this to the end, no matter what. The secret that had been haunting both of them disappears as everything is out in the open. They are both finally released from the despair. Obviously, this doesn't erase what happened or the consequences of their actions, but they can finally accept it as the credits roll. A good game, to me, can be a bunch of different things. A good narrative, a varied cast of characters, fun gameplay mechanics, an interesting world to explore, there is so much that can make a game good and, more importantly, stick in your mind after the experience is over. An experience worth remembering. Omori is a game that hit very close to home for me. As soon as I finished it back in March, I knew I wanted to make some sort of video about it. I think it just, just, just took this long to get my thoughts organized enough that it could be coherent in the slightest. And to be honest, it probably wasn't in the end, <laughs> but I'm fine with that. Also, credits to this person who I took the line from because I thought it was so excellently put that I wanted to use it, but I didn't want to like outright steal it, so I, I changed it a little bit so it wasn't plagiarizing, but yeah, cre credit to the original person. Oh, and I need to say that I didn't share my personal experiences to be a sob story or to make you feel bad for me. This just happened to be the best way to explain why I love this game and why it hit me so hard. This happens to a lot of people, and I was lucky enough to have the right people around me at the right time. I'm infinitely better right now, and I've grown a lot as a person since then, so... Yeah. Thanks for watching... A, can you even call it a video essay? Uh, the mess of my thoughts. There, there we go. <laughs> Appreciate it. And if any of the devs are, for some reason, watching, your game is fantastic, and can't wait to see what your team makes next. <laughs>